hi, uh, my name is Julie Q, and I'm a software engineer on the Go team in, at Google in New York City. And today I want to talk about a problem that most of us have probably come across before, which is that at some point, we all want to use some functionality that we're pretty sure somebody else out there has already built before. And when we run into cases like this, we might not want to rebuild that behavior from scratch, but rather what we want to be able to do is find a third-party package to implement it for us. And there's a lot of ways we can go about figuring out which Go package we should use. So today, I want to share with you some of the tools and strategies that I've learned throughout my time working with Go, as well as some new tools that the Go team is working on to help users be able to discover and evaluate third-party packages. So a little bit about uh, what I do on the Go team. Um, I'm currently on the team that's working on building out Go modules. And specifically, I'm leading a project to build a site that Go developers can use to discover and evaluate packages and have the information that they need to learn whether or not they want to integrate the packages that they choose into their code base. And in the course of my time working with Go, I've also come across a lot of cases where I want to consider using a third-party package to do something. And in times like this, I'm often asking myself the question, how do I decide which package to use? So to see what this might look like in practice, let's talk about something that we might want to build and how I can go about finding the third-party packages to do what I need. So to take an example from my personal life, uh, something that I have always loved to do is cook. And when I was growing up, I would use to keep all of my recipes in a recipe book like this. I would handwrite the ones that I really liked into this book, maybe with some notes based off of my experience making it. But over the years, my recipe collection has grown. And it started to look like this. And then this. And then this. And now what ends up happening is that when I actually find an evening where I want to go and cook something, I'll remember that somewhere out there, there's this recipe that I've been meaning to try. And for about half an hour, this will be me. So because my collection these days is such a mess, what I really like to be able to have is a place where I can just keep track of the recipes I liked, just like the good old days of my cookbook. And since I'm an engineer, I'm going to build myself a web app. So what I want to be able to do is go to a website with links to all of my favorite recipes. I want to be able to have some UI where I can go and write recipes in Markdown and then see them rendered in HTML. I want a place where I can store photos so then I can create pages and actually remember what my meal looked like. And when I think about all the features that I need, you can imagine that I might not want to write all of these packages from scratch. And it's also possible that somebody else has already written something to do the thing that I need. So let's talk about how I could go about finding something from this list, uh, maybe like the markdown parser. So whenever I need a package to do something, the first place that I usually check is the Go standard library and other packages maintained by the Go team. I know that these packages are going to be well maintained and widely used. But the Go standard library also can't solve every problem. And in this case, it doesn't have a markdown parser. But thankfully, there are millions of Go developers in our community, and many of them are willing to open source and share their packages. So today, I want to talk to you about how we can go about actually finding these packages. We'll talk about the discovery phase, or how to find packages. We'll then talk about the signals that you can use to go about evaluating these third-party packages. And lastly, we'll talk about how you can actually go about maintaining them in the long run. So let's get started with the first part of our journey, which is discovery. In the discovery phase, what I'm trying to figure out is what already exists that does what I need. So one thing I could do to find this markdown parser is I could just put out a tweet and ask my friends what they're using. And if I'm really lucky, I might also get back a really helpful response. And one of the great things about crowdsourcing for answers is that if a developer I trust is suggesting a package, then it's a strong signal that it's going to be something very usable. But if no one had responded to my questions, I'd probably have to resort to searching for it myself. And if I type going markdown parser into Google, I might find that there are a lot of results. A lot and a lot of results. And 
oftentimes now, the issue now is just that I have way too many choices. So how do I actually decide which one of these to use? Let's talk about some of the evaluation signals that you can use to figure out which package is best for you. So of the packages that I've found, I want to figure out, are they going to help me solve my problem? And are they going to help me not only solve this problem today, but also maybe six months from now or even a few years from now? It can be hard to get a definitive answer to some of these questions, but there are heuristics that we can use. So one of the first things I might want to look at is just whether the license for a third-party package is actually acceptable for our intended use. Just because I see a project on GitHub doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to have a proper license or even a license at all. And in my case, maybe when I first started the project, I was just setting it up for fun. But over time, maybe I'll find that there's a lot of traffic to my site, and people seem to really like my recipes. And this website could be something that maybe takes off and I could turn into a small business. So <laughs> I might put up a few ads <laughs> and start using my recipe website to make money. If I'm now using packages that have licenses that don't allow for commercial use, it means that legally I'm not actually allowed to use this code and that I could get in trouble for doing so. But if I do determine that I am allowed to use this package, then one of the next things I'll often look at is the package popularity. So there's a lot of metrics that we can use to measure popularity, from the download statistics to the number of GitHub stars and forks. But a lot of this data can also just be noise. So for example, if I find that a package has a lot of stars, it might not necessarily mean that the quality of the package is good. Maybe the package just got a lot of exposure on Hacker News recently. But when we actually look at popularity, what we're really using it as a heuristic for is have other people used this package before and are they evaluating it favorably? So that's why the number of other packages that actually depend on this library is probably one of the most useful signals from this list. If there are a lot of people using the package, then it's a good sign that the code works well enough and that bugs are likely going to be detected faster. So now I know I'm allowed to use this project. I know other people are using it. Another thing I might now want to look at is the actual code quality of the project, just to understand the state of the code today. When I'm evaluating code quality, what I'm trying to figure out is, does this look like code that I would be willing to accept into my own code base? For example, uh, let's discuss another feature that I need for my site, which is some uh, sort of package that's going to be able to help me read and write from a blob storage. So when I first started using a package, I want to know, is it actually clear to me how this code is supposed to be used? High quality packages will have really clear documentation, particularly if the feature set is really large. When I look at the package's documentation, I want to be able to see that there's package level documentation that describes the overall feature set. I also want to see examples to make it clear how to actually use the package. In looking at the specific functions, I want to see that all the exported types and functions are being documented well. So this means having information like what the function is doing, what I can expect to happen to the parameters, and what kind of errors I can expect to be returned. It should be clear from the documentation alone how to use the package. Next, I would get a sense of the tests. So tests help to establish that the code's basic functionality is correct and that regressions are going to be caught in the future. A useful check for this would just be to open up the repository and look at the package and see if there are any tests, uh, if there are any test files. If not, it's going to be pretty unlikely that there are any tests in this package. It's also useful to know if these tests are actually passing. So a lot of repositories might have a badge in their readme to indicate the latest status of their build. And you can also download the package and run its test to make sure that they pass. Depending on the packages and the edge cases that you expect to run into, it could be useful to write your own tests. And lastly, I would just want to look at the code itself and see if it looks like idiomatic Go code. Seeing that the code follows conventions is really important because you might have to debug this code later on. And depending on what it looks like and if, it, if the code is unlike anything you've ever seen before, then you could be in for a late night. So open up a few files and scan for the general shape and style of the code and ask yourself, 
does this look like clear readable Go code? Does it look like this code has been Go formatted? Are you seeing a lot of places where the code is panicking or exiting unexpectedly? And are errors being returned in such a way that you can handle and log them in your own project? And when you look at the functions, are they returning concrete types that are understandable, or are there many layers of abstractions? Whether or not the source code follows Go conventions can give you a sense of its overall quality. And even if the state of the code is great today, we have to get a, want to get a sense of how we can actually expect this code to change over time. And this is particularly important if the code is complicated and likely to have bugs or security vulnerabilities, such as this API client that I need for accessing images from my site. So when I'm evaluating the upkeep of a package, one of the things that I might actually want to look at is what is the maintainer activity for this package? A useful signal would just be to maybe see who the maintainers actually are. If the maintainers have a really good reputation for maintaining high quality packages, or this package seems to be maintained by a large group of people, maybe being paid, then the package is likely to have steady improvements in upkeep. It's also useful to look at the package's commit history and see how long the code has actively been maintained for, especially if you think this is a project that requires active development. And in order to figure out if that's the case, you can look at the project's issue tracker and check for the status of existing bugs. Uh, are you seeing that there are a lot of bugs open? And how long have they been open for? Do you see if issues are getting promptly fixed? And even more importantly, if you decide to submit a fix to this project, you want to know that this is going to be a project where your hard work is going to get merged. Or does it look more like this is going to be one of those cases where you know, you're going to be sitting around waiting for days and days, having to manage your own fork, and really just wonder, is anyone home? <laughs> Knowing that my bugs are going to be get fixed, that was really just only one part of evaluating upkeep. I also want to know that when these fixes are released, that I can upgrade my packages, and I won't have to worry about seeing any breaking changes. And in general, the API is going to be something that's stable over time. After all, when you decide on a package, it's a long-term commitment. So you care about what's going to happen to this package in the future. And you don't want to commit to a package that has a history of breaking its users. So when we look at a third-party Go package, how do we actually know what sort of compatibility promises it's making to us? Well, with the introduction of modules to the Go ecosystem, there are actually some conventions you can start to use. For those of you who are not familiar with modules, a module is a set of packages that are versioned together. So these packages generally have some sort of shared functionality. And modules give us a way of grouping packages together in a unit so that they can evolve together. So as an example, this is what the module for the Blob API client that I'm using might look like. In my code, I might be using the GCS Blob package to interact with Google Cloud Storage. But this package could be inside a broader module with packages for other storage services. And each of these packages for GCS Blob, S3 Blob, and Azure Blob, they might have some related functionality and shared third-party dependencies. So from the provider's point of view, this collection of packages is something that should be evolving together as a unit. And why this matters to you for evaluating API stability is because modules formalize certain conventions that signal what compatibility promises a third-party package is making to you. And one of these is the import compatibility rule, which states the following for stable packages. If an old package and a new package have the same import path, the new package must be backwards compatible with the old package. So if I'm upgrading my third-party package and its import path hasn't changed, then I should expect it to be backwards compatible with any code that I've already written. The second is that modules follow the rules of semantic versioning. So this means that if I'm using a blob client at version 1.1.0, and I want to upgrade it to version 1.2.3, I shouldn't have to worry that the code is no longer going to compile because an exported function was removed. But I should also be able to expect that the behavior hasn't changed and that the API is going to continue working in the same way. But on the other hand, if I see a package with a, uh, a module of a ver major version of zero, 
then this indicates that this is an initial development and it might have breaking changes in the future. So lastly, you want to actually look at the third-party package that you're using and see what it is depending on itself. From your point of view, when you're evaluating a package, this might seem like the only thing that you would be interested in. But this package, it's bringing in a lot of things into your code base because of its own transitive imports. And you might want to be able to see how many imports it has and evaluate each of these imports using the strategies we just discussed. We want to know, does the dependency that you're evaluating have dependable dependencies? Otherwise, we might find ourselves in a situation on a late Friday night when we have to deploy a bug fix, only to be staring at errors in a build log, trying to figure out what went wrong, and maybe find that one of our indirect dependencies has been deleted, and nobody knows where the code is gone. And of course, something that you could do in this specific case is to use a module mirror, which can help you accelerate go builds and protect against disappearing dependencies. The Go team provides a module mirror at proxy.golang.org, but there are also others like Athens and Go Center. And if you want to learn about module proxies in general, you should go to Aaron's talk tomorrow morning. So we've looked at several signals today for evaluating packages. And we started by asking, how do I decide which package to use? But it's also possible that by the end of the evaluation phase, you're asking yourself the question, should I be using a third-party package at all? Or should I just implement it myself? After all, using a dependency always comes at a cost. And the cost of adding a dependency for really trivial functions is likely higher than just writing the code yourself. For example, let's say that something I wanted to do as part of my app is I want to write myself notes in my recipes. And I want to be able to have these notes formatted in such a way that they're aligned to the right side of the page. And since Markdown is going to get uh, converted to HTML, and HTML is going to compress all of my, these spaces into one character, I might not be able to do that with the Markdown parser that I'm using. So maybe my immediate reaction is, I should just find a third-party package to solve this for me. And in my search, I might find this really fitting package called Markdown Align Write. And what it claims to, uh, claims to do is take text that is in these tags and align them to the right side of the page. But if I open up the code and look at it, I might find that all it is is one function called pad left. And <laughs> what this function does is it pads a bunch of white space characters to the left side of your string. And this would just be the output of that function. And in this case, the cost of using the dependency could be a lot higher than just re-implementing it myself. After all, even a single function can introduce problems. As we've seen, a dependency can bring in more dependencies with it, and any of one of them can cause a problem when you least expect it. Or what if the code contained some unhelp what if the package contained some unhelpful code at the bottom of the file, and I just missed it during my evaluation process? And of course, instead of looking for a third-party package, I could have also used the CSS properties to solve this problem. But there are times when my evaluation process leads me to wanting to commit to a package. And in this case, I'm going to have to think about how I can maintain this package in, my long, in the long run. A package might work great for me today, but what work do I have to do to make sure it continues working a few months or a few years from now? After all, if my recipe business is doing great, I'm going to want to keep maintaining my site. And doing that means not keeping not only my own code base up to date, but actually maintaining the third-party packages that I've decided to pull into it as well. So the most important step in maintenance is simply just staying up to date. We want to know when new versions are being released, especially if the new release is fixing a security vulnerability. And if the project you're interested in has a mailing list or a Twitter handle, it's something that you could subscribe to. For example, whenever a new release is available in Go, we'll send an email to Golang Announce and also post from the Golang Twitter. And GitHub also now lets you watch repositories specifically for new releases. And there are paid services that will automatically create pull requests whenever a new version is available. And lastly, as you continue to use a package and decide to commit to it, you might also consider contributing to the project yourself. 
This can be done uh, through doing things like reporting bugs as you come across them. It could be contributing fixes, documentation updates, or adding examples and tests. And if this project is being created by a group of independent developers in their free time, you might also choose to donate financially, which can be done through various sites like GitHub sponsors and Patreon. So we've talked about a lot of strategies and ways to discover packages, the signals you can use to evaluate them, and how to maintain these dependencies in the long term. And hopefully you've learned something new and feel like the next time you're in search for a third-party package, you have some tools that can help you go about figuring out which one is, the, which one is right for you. But when you uh, actually take all this information and you sit down and look at the third-party packages that come up in your search results, and you're going through all of their distinct documentation and looking through the code and running their own analyzers, you might also find that your computer screen winds up looking like this. And at that point, rather than feeling really empowered of all of this information, it might feel like it's hitting you all at once. And that's totally understandable, because really, the way that we discover and evaluate packages as it is today is pretty overwhelming. So how can we make this process better? Well, the good news is that there are a lot of tools that already exist in the Go community today. For viewing documentation, you can easily see the documentation for any package at godoc.org. There are plenty of tools available to the Go community for checking code quality and running static analysis. For example, Go Report Card will run static analysis on some really important signals like Go Fumped and Go Vet. Alternatively, you could download a package and run a tool like Static Check to look for code correctness, simplicity, and style. You can use the Go command to evaluate test coverage, which will not only show us what percentage of tests, um, or what percentage of code is being covered, but specifically which lines are being covered or not. And while as a Go community, we've come pretty far in developing tools for evaluating third-party packages. Of the signals that I've talked about today, there's still so much more that we could do. Which is why on the Go team, we've been asking ourselves, how can we make this process even better? Well, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I've been leading a project to build a site that Go users can use to discover and evaluate packages and have the information they need to learn about whether or not they want to integrate the packages they choose into their projects. It's something that we've been working on this year, and I want to share with you some of the things that we've been building and where we're going with this project. So taking a package, uh, cloud.google.com slash go slash storage as an example, with the introduction of modules and version packages as a user on the site, I would be able to see the documentation for any version of the package. Most importantly to me, the version that I'm choosing to use in my project. I'd be able to see the readme for the repository, which might have useful information for getting started, where to get help, and how to contribute to the project. I could see what other packages are part of the module and if any of them might be useful to me. Along with information such as the package's release history to get a sense of the project's upkeep, what the package is importing, and information for each of its imports, so I can see what the package is pulling indirectly into my code base. And what the packages, uh, what packages are importing this third-party package to give me a sense of its overall popularity. And information about the package's license. So then I know whether it's acceptable for my intended use. So these slides are just to show you what we've been working on so far. In the long run, the goal for the site is to provide a more streamlined discovery and evaluation experience. So that when I actually do decide to go and sit down and build myself my recipe website, and I find I need to look for a markdown parser, I won't be spending my time going to Google and looking through a bunch of results to come up with search. And I won't have a computer screen that looks like this, or have my day like this, but rather given all the different signals that I could be using to evaluate a package. I'll have some way of seeing all of this information in an aggregated form so that it's more comprehensible to me. And for each of the third-party packages I'm evaluating, I'll be able to have access to this information and so when I actually do decide to go typing into a search bar, looking for a markdown parser for my project, I'll be able to see a list of results 
and it will be easier for me to figure out which third-party packages would work for my project. So there's a lot of signals that we've been thinking about including to provide this experience, and building out these signals is part of a long-term project that will likely evolve over time. So far this year, we've been laying the foundation for the site and working towards launching it for everyone to use. And if this is a project that you're interested in and want to stay up to date, there are a few ways to do so while this project is still in development. So we're going to be posting uh, updates about the discovery site on the Go issue tracker on GitHub. If you're interested in trying out the site, uh, you can sign up here to be an early tester. And lastly, I'll be here for the rest of the conference, so please come talk to me or reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you.